is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Veronica Mars, Season 2, Episode 7. Nobody puts baby in a corner. In this episode, this has got to be one of the weirdest Veronica Mars episodes I have ever seen. This just caught me so completely off guard, you guys. I don't even know. I got nothing here. This was weird. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Um, I want to thank Jackie for commissioning this episode. Jackie also commissioned the live watch of this episode. Those of you who are interested can find that on the um, Facebook page, facebook.com slash unspoiled pod and hang out with me while I uh, eat some pizza and watch the app. This, I can understand why you all wanted to see my reaction to this because this was so out of left field that I don't really still quite understand. And I'm, I'm guessing I won't until I see the next episode. I don't have a good handle on what this is going to mean for the rest of what's going on in the show going forward. It feels like they're setting up something that's going to remain for the rest of the season. But this show does do things where it will set up something and then sort of drop it. So I'm not, I'm, I'm just very curious to see exactly how much more we get to see of what's going on in that household. And if Meg wakes up, which I'm assuming she will, like how she feels about how all of this has been handled. Um, because what I want to think is that like, her father realized that Meg was going to blow the whistle on what him and his wife were doing and that she was like their target. Um, but I don't see even parents as apparently bananas as Meg's parents are. I don't see them being willing to kill a bus full of children to silence their daughter. Ah, I don't know, guys. Like, because, like I said, I don't know how much this is going to come into play later, if it's going to be a an ongoing issue that we keep, like, coming back to, or if it's going to be sort of dropped until we need it again. Because, like, they definitely do that with, for example, what's going on with uh, Wallace is really – guys, Wallace bailed, like, two episodes ago now, and we have seen hide nor hair of him on the show – we haven't gotten any information about what is going on with him. We get to see that Veronica is writing to him, but that is literally all. We never get anything from his point of view. We never find out where he is. We never see his mother like coming over to Veronica and asking her, like, do you know what's going on? Or freaking out to Keith about it, who, you know, they are supposed to be still dating. So one would think that that would be a pretty big factor for her right now, but she's not really around at all. And apparently Jackie has fallen off of the face of the earth as well. Um, which like, don't get me wrong. I really do not like Jackie as a character, but I also find it strange how Wallace disappears and suddenly Jackie is not like in the picture either. I, I said it last time and I ex expected for maybe there to be an episode between what happened and when she starts to like, really get on Veronica's case about everything. But by now, I really think this should have happened. And it's weird how everybody who is in Veronica's life who has anything to do with Wallace isn't coming to her or, you know, like she's the one that handles this kind of shit. Jackie knows that Veronica hates her and knows that Veronica is aware she fucked her shit up. But Jackie is also a shameless person, clearly. 
And I just don't buy that she would be at all above coming to Veronica for help now that Wallace has run off, despite what the two of them feel about one another. And like I said, Alicia should really be a factor here also, because she's dating Keith as well. So this episode brings up this like crazy shit happening in this house, but I don't really have a lot of confidence that it's going to continue telling that story. And that's a pretty big bomb to drop and then leave. So I'm kind of trying to like be optimistic, but I also don't en entirely trust that they know what they're doing with this, with bringing up something as, you know, we can talk about murder and infidelity and everything, but when we start into get to start getting into the realm of like child abuse and trauma, um, and, and I'm, I'm saying that, specifically even though we have seen logan getting beat by his dad it's very clear that this has been going on his whole life but that we only get to see it once logan's a teenager but i'm saying i'm talking about this child abuse because she is a tiny child and we're seeing this like in the context of everybody finding out about it logan as far as we know hasn't told anybody like veronica says something about how his dad used to beat him, you know, but she seems to like have figured that out. I don't think that Logan confided that to her and ditto for, you know, what's going on with, uh, with Duncan. I feel like Duncan, you know, put the pieces together himself. He hung around Logan. He saw the damage and figured, I think his dad's beating him, but I don't think Logan ever confided to Duncan about it. And I could be wrong about that. But this is a situation in which it has been uh, like it has. Oh, Anya's is here. Hi, Anya's. Um, this is a situation in which outside people have found out that this girl is being abused. The police have been notified and they are, you know, they've this is a, another level of involvement in a situation like this. And I I'm just a little bit concerned about how the show is going to handle it going forward. So we'll see if it does at all. You know, on the one hand, I want this father to get some retribution. I want both parents to, but it feels like the father is really the like mastermind of this ugly situation. However, I also feel like I would rather they inexplicably drop something like this if they aren't going to be able to do it well. And I am not entirely sure if I trust they will do it well. So I'm of a split mind here. It's just such a strange episode too, guys. Like, I don't really understand. It feels almost like a retcon. Like, they wanted something to be going on with Meg, but they didn't know what. And they just dropped this weird thing in there. Um, And also, I thought in that picture that Meg was with her two sisters but does she just have the one and what's going on if she does have two with the other one Duh. i have a lot of mixed feelings about this guy so all right let's let's start this off let's um we have the first scene where veronica and duncan are making out and they are watching the big lebowski which now that i think about it is pretty perfect a start to an episode that is as sort of weirdly surreal as this is um, and they are making out in a way that suggests that they are definitely going to get up and fuck in a second. And then Logan walks in and he seems really delighted with the fact that he is clearly cock blocking his friend and sort of relishes that for a few minutes before he gets a knock on the door and goes and answers it. And it turns out that this is Kendall coming in to, continue to fuck Logan. Guys, I am blown away. Um, Anya says, no, we already met the older sister who's like one year behind Meg at school. All right. So there, so she does have two sisters is what you're saying. The one that's one year behind Meg. And then this girl, Grace, who is what? 10 maybe. So what's going on with that other sister then? Um, I can't believe that Kendall is still fucking Logan. I really can't. Like, 
now that we know, like towards the end of the episode, what's going on with her financially, that makes sense like later. But at this point in the episode, she is not aware that she has no money. So she's just fucking him because she wants to keep fucking him, which means either a he is very, very good and bad, which go Logan or B. I don't know what like I just expected once it came out that they were having an affair that she would pull away from him and not want to be seen around him again. He apologizes to Dick as if to say, well, that's all over now. But it's completely not. And I assumed it was because same thing. I thought that Logan once like really what I figured Logan was getting off on was the secrecy of it and the like kind of giving the finger to uh, Dick and Beaver's dad. So the fact that it all got put out in the open, I sort of expected that was going to remove a lot of the fun for him, that the mystique of it would be gone and that he would just be like, well, all right, time to move on and do something else super dangerous and kind of sketchy. But no, he's continuing to carry on with this woman. And I'm just really, really surprised by that. So, all right. So, yeah, he says my code word will be endurance, which, oh, Logan. Okay. Duncan, why are you letting him stay in the same room with you in the same suite? Just find another room, another hotel, another set of suites. Don't do this, guys. This is soups weird. You know, like, oh, I hate it. And he tries at that point, Duncan tries to continue making out with Veronica, who is just like, mm, hard pass. That was super weird. I'm definitely not in the mood anymore. And he seems to just be like, well, why are you letting that ruin it? And I'm like, come on. He tries to tell her. Well, you know. How he she says, how does this not bother you? And he says, uh, it doesn't bother me because I'm a guy. If he if he was in there with their real mom, I'd be bothered. But it's Kendall. She's like our age. And Veronica says she's 25. And he says, yeah, but not really. You know what I mean? She's and Veronica gives him a look and he goes, what? She's hot. Like that's news. <sighs> Duncan, buddy, sweetie. All right. Listen, first of all, I think we can all agree that bitch is not 25. It's fine for the sake of the show. Sure, she's 25 because Veronica is definitely not no 17 either. So, okay. But the fact that this woman is fucking a high school boy, and this is something that just happens in every show like this. They don't have the high school kids looking like high school kids because most kids who look like high school kids cannot act. So they have them looking older and thus... Because they look older and are so much like closer in apparent age to the rest of the cast, it makes it less icky that they wind up getting in relationships with people who are basically full on fledged adults in the rest of the show. And for context here, I will give you I, may I present Pretty Little Liars in which Every single fucking character on that show, all of these girls who are all in high school, almost every single one of them has a relationship with a full ass grown man at one point or another. And nobody seems to be creeped out by it at all. Like there's teachers, there's police officers, there's all kinds of like, and there are fucking high school students. And it is really hard for me to get past it, even though I know that is a conceit of like of high school TV drama. I understand that. It's just so mind blowing to me. I don't. And this may be a function of them being rich. And when I say them, I mean specifically Duncan and Logan. When you have a lot of money, the way that you interact with the world is going to be different than other people. And maybe for them, having relationships with people a lot older is par for the course, because when you're wealthy, you are going to have like a bigger social circle. You're going to have a lot more like kind of um, 
old family friends that have like sons and daughters who were in high school with you but aren't anymore or whose uh, younger brother is still in high school with you but they're older like that kind of thing there's a lot more of a like societal sort of incest when you are wealthy and you travel in the same circles all the time so maybe that's part of it but if I had been in high school and one of the guys that I went to school with was consistently fucking a 25 year old woman and we all knew about it that would have been very weird to us that would not have been something that we just took in stride and and we're just like oh well you know that would have been like this i mean good for him i guess but you know this whole thing and the what what happens later we don't actually get any information on this but kendall finds out that basically her husband has made no provision for her, which even if he had, they have a a um, prenuptial agreement that if she cheats on him, she doesn't get anything, which I would imagine still would apply in one way or another, even though they're not actually divorcing here. She's not divorced. She's just trying to continue to live while he hides out in wherever he's at. Where is he? Costa Rica? Um, so she decides that she's going to try and lean on Logan to be her next sugar daddy. And Logan is super, super gross about this, guys. I have such a hard time with my relationship to Logan. And I'm not faulting the show for this. I like that they've made him so complex. But he really can bring out the ugly here and there and just be somebody that I'm like why why are you like this dude so we have this scene where you know Kendall is just like trying to like sort of wrap herself around him and be like oh it feels so good I just love being with you I just want to be with you all the time to which he like immediately cottons on to what she's trying to do here and it's just like "Mm, no I don't think so and gets out of bed and this is the the dialogue here is brutal. Um, one of the problems of sleeping with your stepson's friend, information tends to leak. I know exactly what you're doing. And he gets up and sh- and she says, well, you have a pretty good situation for yourself here. Uh, do you want to go back to cheerleaders that have just mastered missionary? And says, well, then see ya. Or if you want things to keep going the way they've been going, I'm going to need a few things. He says, I'm sorry. See ya was option A. And she's really taken aback by this. And he says, when the milk stops being free, Bessie, I stop drinking it. Whoa, dude. Gross. I hate you right now. Oh, my God. And she says, then what am I supposed to do? And he's just like, I don't give a shit. I really like, that's not my fucking problem. So she gets up and gets dressed and she decides that she's going to go into Duncan's bathroom where he has just been showering and she is going to seduce him. So she undresses and waits for him to get out of the shower. And the show gives us a pretty long, like, weird pause and cuts away in order to suggest to us that maybe he actually took her up on it. And it's really obvious to me that he's not going to have fucked this woman, but I can't imagine what took so long that they were in that room the way that they were for as long as they were that Logan felt the need to mention it later and he wasn't like, is it supposed to be that because Veronica rejected him earlier that he's just thirsty and hasn't gotten off in a like day or two. And so he like caves because she's right there and naked right in front of him. Cause she's clearly naked, right? She's like on his bed and doesn't look like she's wearing anything. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's something like, I just don't see Duncan being willing to cheat like that, but 
I also feel like the show wants there to be some more drama between Duncan and Veronica. And I could see them having him make like a one time mistake in order for that to be like an issue that they then have to deal with. But I don't want them to do that because it feels cheap to me. Does that make sense? So I'm just uh, and I also low key like. She leaves and, and Logan says something to her like, have you ever considered just getting a job? And she says, this is my job. To which, amen, sister, dealing with these creeps does seem like a full-time job. Like, fair enough. Um, it is not the way that I would want to handle things, being basically completely dependent on another person, but to each their own. She, though, there's something about the way that she says that as she leaves that makes me think that there's something else going on. And... I can't help but wonder if like Duncan didn't talk to her about maybe somebody else that she could go after or I don't know, you know, so and then there's that really awful scene because, you know, after she finds out that she hasn't got any money, both the other boys are aware Beaver, Dick and Beaver are aware that she doesn't have any money. And we have this moment at the pool where he Dick brings her a French maid uniform. And he says, that's what you'll be wearing when you dust my armoire. My mother signed over our trust funds. Um, so she's made sure that she, we have enough coin to stay off her couch. And, uh, I see this as a chance to bond with my new mom. So basically what Dick is proposing is that she become his sugar baby. He doesn't care that his dad was fucking her or that Logan was fucking her. He just wants to have power over her. The French maid uniform being like this extra demeaning and he's wearing a shirt, may I add, throughout this scene that just says going commando across the top of it. <laughs> Anya, you took the words right out of my mouth. She's in the chat and says, Dick is so gross. He is like, he is everything terrible. I want bad things to happen to him. I don't know how Beeve is such a good kid. Like, and I say good, obviously, in comparison, you know, relatively. Dick is like, he is looking forward to humiliating this woman in exchange for not throwing her out on the street, basically. And I don't want to get too like sympathetic to Kendall because she really is kind of trashy and terrible and selfish. At the same time, Dick is so disgusting about the whole thing that I can't at all be on his side in the way that he is choosing to do this either. And a lot of that just has to do with like, you know, systemically, how shit goes down with women, we are treated like garbage a lot of the time. And for us to like, actually be able to use the tools that the, the only tools that we have been allowed to use a lot of the time, i.e. sex and our appearance, when we use them to get what we want, it's very frustrating being told that that's not allowed either. So I feel like I have a lot more sympathy for women like Kendall than I used to, who are just sort of like, you know, carrying on a sort of old tradition. Um, I don't, it's again, not something I would want for myself, but it's something understandable. I am beautiful. Men are pathetic and weak, and I will use that to my advantage. I am not forcing them to do anything that they do not want to do. I am simply exploiting a demand, and I will do so until I can't anymore. And there, she's not doing anything without consent. She's not, you know, everything that she has worked out in any of the relationships she has been in has apparently been an agreement between both parties. So... I just don't really have that much of a problem with it. And when you start getting into what Dick is doing, basically it's like blackmail and it's just really like a penthouse letter. Like, you know, it just, it feels like 
the sort of thing that he like fantasized about last night while he was jerking off and was just like, you know what? I'm just going to do it because what is she going to do? She's in no position to leave, which apparently she isn't. Apparently she's got nothing um, because all of the assets have been frozen and those are the only thing that she had any access to. So I just kind of like as I uh, long story short, I don't want Duncan to have cheated, but I do want Kendall to have found a way around everything that's been going on and get some like agency for herself regarding money that is hers, you know, and I don't really know if Duncan like what they could have been doing was did he be like, oh, I can't fuck you. But you know what? And he pulls his computer over and they like log into LinkedIn and he's like, oh, we'll figure something out or go to what is it? Sugarbabies.com or something like that. There's a whole website for that now. Um, <laughs> it reminds me of there's a um, an episode of The Complete Guide to Everything. And they have a section where people write in asking for advice. And this girl who's in college writes in and asks what they think of her basically doing a sort of sugar baby thing where she gets she goes out on dates with men and in exchange they help her cover the cost of living or cost of tuition or whatever and their response was um tom says you know what in my mind do what you want if this is something that you think will like help you out and it will make you happy and you're okay with it all i ask is that you be really safe about it because honestly Men are terrible. And his co-host chimes in and is like, oh, men are terrible. He's like, so yeah, be safe. Let people know where you are. Like alert everybody. And then if you've made sure that all of that is in place and that you are safe and things are okay, bleed those fuckers dry. And I was like cheering when I listened to this. Basically exactly how I feel. If everybody has agreed to all of this, go ahead, girl, get it. So, you know, basically I'm kind of low key team Kendall because everybody else is just as bad. So, all right, that's enough about Kendall, I feel like. Let us begin talking about what's going on with the, uh, first of all, the stock trades for that class that they're all in where it's like the the future leaders of Neptune or whatever it is. Um I don't really like this is this one scene. I was surprised that we're even going back to this at all. But uh, Veronica's stock ha- is like steady, but she's in second place now. Everybody else has almost completely lost everything. Um, the only person that I think that she is in any competition with, I'm trying to remember exactly who she was up against with that. Um, but yeah, Dick Casablancas is like, proud of the fact that he kept it all in her all in the family even though they uh they lost everything um oh yeah it's beef that's right who has just outstripped her and she's like trying to be a uh good sport about it but you can tell that she's like god damn it but yeah everybody else is completely plummeted um we have this weird moment right after that with keith and the uh, mayor, what is it? I can't ever remember this guy's name, guys. I'm so sorry, but I don't know what it is about him. He is so <sighs> weirdly forgettable. He's it's 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 weird. He's forgettable in a way that is very realistic to me. Um, he's forgettable in the way that an annoying car salesman is forgettable. Does that make sense? Because he's just so aggressively, like, selling all the time in the way that he stands and holds himself and everything. It is just really uncomfortable to be around him. And I want to forget him as soon. Woody. That is the name. Right, right, right. Um, So Keith has come here and he is like trying to push him about what's going on with the bus crash and whether or not there are more investigations going on here. Um, And he says, essentially what this dude is telling Keith here in this scene is 
that he plans to gentrify all of Neptune so that nobody can afford to live there anymore unless they are an O-Niner. He says, I promised a cleaner, safer Neptune. I'm going to do it via incorporation. Turn our little county seed into a full-fledged city. Um, Santa Barbara, Carmel, La Jolla, they all did it. Upped their tax base, turned that revenue into antique street lamps, cobblestone streets, increased sanitation. I defy you to find graffiti in Carmel, Keith. It cannot be done. Um, so Keith says, well, where are you talking about? And he says, I, we would extend the boundaries south to the marina, north to the airfield, and west to, or east to the reservoir. And Keith says, that's not a town, Woody. That's a country club. Um, he says 9,000 people would reside here. They'd need a chief of police. The county would still have lamb, but they would also have you. Twice the protection, everybody wins. And Keith says, I wouldn't even be able to afford to live here anymore. And he gives him a look and says, oh, we'd make it worth your while. And this is the thing. They probably would. They'd probably make it very worth his while. And all he'd have to do is sit by and watch everybody else forced out. <sighs> That's not exactly a position that I see Keith occupying with any sort of comfort. And I sure fucking couldn't. Um, oh, Anya says, Woody Goodman. Anya, I don't know. You called that other guy Goodman last time. And I'm not sure I trust you anymore. <laughs> Um, don't really understand the incorporation thing as a non-American. Yeah, even as an American, it's something that I have trouble with because um, it's it's a thing that I've only recently, I think in the past two years, I've read a couple books set in places that were, quote, unincorporated townships, um, which basically means that they are not afforded the same like rights and privileges as a place that's a full-fledged town. Um, <laughs> Anya says that she checked on his name. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, Woody Goodman. God, that is a fucking name and a half, isn't it? Woody Goodman. We've got Dick Beaver and Woody on this show. They need to calm down these writers with these fucking names. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So the unincorporated township thing is, um, something that happens like a fair amount, actually, I thought that it was maybe something very rare, but I was surprised once I looked into it, how common that is. And it's especially common in areas like where they're trying to get around certain laws sometimes, and they don't want to be under the same sort of jurisdiction or, or um, like one example was there was an unincorporated township bordering a uh, Native American reservation in the Dakotas and they were allowed to sell liquor or at least beer on these in these townships without the sort of taxation that they would otherwise have incurred somewhere else. And um, they were basically completely exploiting the reservation as well. And like there were it, it, the whole story with what's going on with the um, with reservations being exploited because of rampant alcoholism and people who are bringing in almost half of the like state revenue in taxes just via the sale of beer. And they don't care that there are people literally dying on the street outside because of alcohol poisoning. It's really gross guys. Basically, you know, native Americans are still suffering because white people love to just ruin their lives for money. Um, but yeah, so I didn't realize you know, until somebody mentioned it, maybe the last episode or the episode before that Neptune is unincorporated. Um, and that really does change a lot of things. Once you find that out, then there's there are a lot more directions you can go in. This guy has a lot of room to sort of maneuver around and make deals using the town as a sort of chip. And that's kind of worrisome. You know, I mean, gentrification is very real even in towns that are established so if it's not even like if things aren't even set in stone i imagine that this guy could do some pretty serious damage if he wanted to in terms of like preventing people who are of lower income from being able to find anywhere to live or get approved um 
this is, you know, I do not care for this. It's just an ugly scene. And the way that he seems to trust that Keith is going to be interested in getting like paid well, more than Keith actually gives a shit about like the town still being okay. And he also isn't at all interested in talking about the bus crash or what's going on with that. I can't help but wonder if he didn't like set up something with this crash in order to like make people afraid to help out his campaign. And I don't know enough about this character to tell whether or not he is that kind of psycho. Um, But I have to say that if I found out that he had done that, well, it wouldn't make a ton of sense as far as with the information that I've got now. I wouldn't even be that surprised because this dude just doesn't seem quite right. Um, All right. So let's get into like the main plot point here. Um, First of all, there's Logan pulling Veronica aside, talking to her about this mysterious witness that came forward and um, talked to her about how this dude does not, he saw a picture of him, does not look like the guy that was actually on the bridge. And Veronica's like, you told us you couldn't remember anything. And he's like, of course I said that. The guy called the police on me and found me standing there with a knife in my hand, apparently, or laying there with it. I did not want the police to find him. But I know that this dude who's claiming to be the guy is not the one. So I need you to figure out who he is and why in the hell he would come and like be a false witness a witness against me. And Veronica finds out that this dude is a plastic surgeon who's pretty well respected. And she goes to his business pretending that she is looking to have some work done. And it's amazing. I really appreciated that this guy is like, are you kidding me? Because Veronica is sitting there with a pretty decent sized pair of tits for somebody who is as tiny as she is, a perfect nose. Um, And she's like trying to talk about how she wants to deal with the bump on her nose. She's got no bump. Get the hell out of here. You have like one of the most perfect noses in television, which is really saying something because getting a nose job is like de rigueur for somebody who is... uh on television. Like the bump that she has is so slight that it just get out of here. And there's one other thing that she mentions, breast augmentation, nose job. Oh, and her lips could use some work, which like, I guess they're proportional to your face. Stop it. And this guy is just like, "Mm, you know what? It seems like you maybe have some body dysmorphia. Here's a pamphlet on that. And you're gorgeous and you really don't need to get any work done. Guys, can I tell you how much I wish somebody had a fucking body dysmorphia pamphlet for me when I was a teenager? Because I really genuinely think I had that shit. I would see myself in the mirror and occasionally when I wasn't like prepared, I would be startled because I pictured myself as being like more at the weight that I am now. I pictured myself as being at that weight when I was in high school and occasionally would be like, oh, I'm actually thin. And then I'd be like, No, but I'm not, though. And I would, like, have a moment of clarity and then completely dismiss my own eyes and be like, yeah, maybe I think that. But that's because I have a skewed sense of what is fat and what isn't because I am fat. And so to me, this is normal, but it's not normal. And I just, like, really thought that I was, like, the fat friend. I look back now, I was the hot friend. But most of the time, I didn't realize it at all until like way later. And even then, I still thought, well, you know, I'm I'm good looking for somebody who's heavy. I wasn't heavy, guys, not even close. And I just didn't see myself clearly. And I just really appreciate that we have reached a place where body dysmorphia is something that people like are are starting to understand and point to. Um you know, obviously the context these days is very different because there's also a lot of dysmorphia that's associated with like being trans or just struggling with gender identity in general. And uh, that's a whole other like kettle of fish. There's a lot going on there that I have no point of reference for personally. But this, like, I appreciated that this guy was just like, dude, you're a child. I'm not doing this. Um, So Veronica takes that and the fact that he's like, not going to help her 
you know, cut her body into pieces and calls up Logan and is like, well, I don't know. This guy seems like he's a pretty good guy. And I'm like, that's a big leap to make, girl. The fact that he doesn't want you to go have unnecessary surgery does not mean that he's a good person. It just means that he's protecting his practice. You know, like people are going to find out if you're giving young, beautiful women unnecessary surgery, and that's not going to reflect well on you. He's somebody that obviously takes that seriously. So I appreciated that she decides to continue to pursue it, and she follows him into a cigar shop, and she can't figure out where he's at. She goes in there and, you know, she followed him there, sat in the car waiting for him. There's like a full 30 minutes and she finally is like, what is taking so long? And goes in. And when she first goes in, she can't even find him. And then he comes out from like a back room. And later on, when she's talking to her father, he says something about how that cigar shop was notorious for dealing drugs. I tried to nail them a bunch of times and I was never able to do it. So please, if you have to use the bathroom somewhere, don't go back there again. Find someplace else. Because he can smell smoke on her clothes and he thinks that she's been smoking. Um, so yeah, this opens up a whole other thing that maybe there's like a cartel situation that's going on that Logan has unwittingly gotten into the middle of. I don't know what that would even look like, but, you know, we'll see. Um, I'm very curious about this, though, because it's a weird it's a weird tack for this show in particular to take. Getting into organized crime is not something I expected. You know, I thought that we were going to stick with like crimes of passion, personal um, vendettas or or uh, revenge or things like that. We're getting into like circles of people here who are making money. And this is a very different situation. So, you know, in terms of like who was on that bus, I don't know if that's related at all to what's going on here, but I feel like they're going to have to tie together somehow. And I don't see how that happens. We'll see. Um, so yeah, that's about as much information as she gets is that that particular plot thread ends with her father being like, I tried to nail them for drugs a lot. Didn't work. Um, so, all right, let's see. Moving on here to next plot thread. Um, oh, okay. So she's, this is when she starts talking to Duncan about what's going on with Meg and the fact that he like looked through her stuff and found out that she was in touch with a social worker and Meg did a ton of babysitting and she has come across a child that she thinks is being abused and is trying to put a case together with a social worker on the DL. And Duncan feels that since she has been incapacitated they are going to have to continue this work on her behalf for her because there's a child out there who's suffering and who knows what could happen. Um, he says that, you know, the kid isn't actually being physically abused. There's nothing sexual going on. That It's more that the kid is being like mentally tormented. And this is such a weird scene too, because she like says something about how Veronica says something about how startled she is at the amount of babysitting that Meg did. And Duncan says something like, oh, you know, because she got a job. Have you ever heard of it? And I'm like, Duncan, do you know who you're fucking talking to, dude? Like, Veronica is a huge worker. What do you you're the rich kid who doesn't need to work. Why are you saying it to her like she doesn't know? It's a weird moment to me that feels very out of place. And I don't know who wrote that, but it doesn't ring true at all. Um, So. He wants her to uh, go and track down, like, by going to all of the houses of the different people that Meg babysat for, to track down a writing sample from each of these little kids. Because Meg had a writing sample somewhere of this child's uh, writing, like, in a notebook, where they had to repeat something over and over again. 
And they're going to try and compare the samples that she got to whatever it is that's in Meg's uh, book. That is going to mean that they have to eventually break into Meg's house and figure out where she's hiding that piece of evidence. But for now, what Veronica has to focus on is getting into the houses and getting access to the children of the various people that Meg babysat for. So there's a lot happening here. Um, She is... The first thing that she does is she gets involved in the uh, sleepover with um, Kristen Ritter's character, whose name I do not remember. Gia. Gia. Um, Gia, I am so torn about. She invites Veronica over and seems to be excited about it. But then it turns out that she has invited like all of the girls over that are Veronica's like special enemies. And I don't really know if it's supposed to be a purposeful snub or if she just doesn't know Veronica well enough to realize what she has done. It could go either way. It just depends on how clueless I think Gia actually is. And she's new to town, so she could be sort of clueless. But there is something about it that feels malicious to me. And I don't know if that's me reading into it too much or not. It's mostly based in the fact that Veronica is so obviously not warned. And it's so obviously not bothering Gia at all when at one point Veronica is like, you know what, I'm out of here. And she gets up to leave. Gia doesn't stop her or ask her like, hey, what's wrong? Is everything okay? Like, it doesn't, it seems more like she finds it amusing that Veronica is just going to leave. And because of that, it makes me think that she did this on purpose. But I don't know why, like if there's something about Veronica that she personally doesn't like for whatever reason, I don't know. Um, Hmm. Anyway, so that the, and what kills me too is like the sleepover. Now I said this when I was watching it, the sleepover itself in a lot of ways, it's obviously supposed to be like, what Veronica would think was actual hell, which is a bunch of girls dancing around to Rihanna songs and, uh, and painting their nails and whatever. But this for me looks like a lot of fun. Um, and I felt a little bit about Veronica, the way that I do about like Bella Swan, who I'm covering twilight for $5 and up patrons for those of you who don't know. And Bella's kind of a party pooper where people are having like a perfectly lovely time and want to invite her to also have a perfectly lovely time. And she acts like it's the biggest like chore ever to dress nice and go out and have dinner or dance with people. And it's just like, girl, can't you just appreciate that you're like hanging out with people and there's music and everybody is in a good mood at the very least. Um, But also the sleepover feels really like staged and fake which also makes me sort of like not trust Gia um it's like somebody who writes for you know a men's magazine wrote what he thought a girl sleepover would be like so I the whole thing with Gia is just so weird and it turns out that she has a little brother and Veronica sort of like keeps an eye on what's going on with him And there's this weird scene where he like spills water on the floor and it's just water. That's all it is. But he spills water on the floor while he's doing some sort of like project. And what's notable there is the disproportionate reaction that he has. And I don't even mean disproportionate in terms of like you just spilled some water and you're acting like you're about to be like, you know, that like that was like radioactive and you're about to get turned into a mutant. But I also mean disproportionate in comparison with Gia, who she says to him, it's just water. Will you calm down? What is wrong with you? And that for me signals that there's something else going on with this kid that it's not abuse. Although I won't say that kids that like you have siblings and one of them doesn't get abused and another one escapes because parents will often pick one child in particular and, and, you know, 
pick on them because they know that that child isn't going to fight back the same way. Um, but there's something about how Gia seems so totally unconcerned. And usually when a parent picks a certain child and picks on that one child in a way that they don't with the others, the other children are still aware it's happening. They escape the abuse itself, but they are aware the abuse is taking place. And a lot of times a parent will make them aware on purpose so that they know what's at stake is that I will hurt your sister if you fuck up kind of thing. Gia, when he's so upset about spilling this water, seems completely baffled by it. And when he, like, his mother comes over and she's so, like, stern with him later. And we don't, there's no, like, dialogue. We don't see them talk. We don't see what she says to her son before she leads him away. There's something about her posture that feels like she's going through some shit. And when she talks to this boy, it's like you want to read it as her yelling at him. But I don't know that that's what's happening. And I'm just really curious about what the situation is with these people and the husband Woody he is sort of like being painted as the man who's afraid of his wife and her temper like he's trying to help his kid clean up because he doesn't want mom to see because mom is going to be mad but I can't help but think from the way that her mother's posture sort of implied her like being curled in on herself i can't help but think that it's the dad that would be the abusive one out of everybody even though he's being treated as this like really sweet guy who is looking out to make sure that his kid doesn't get in unnecessary trouble from another parent who is sort of out of control um but yeah so and and that's like one of the first of a string of weird babysitting situations that Veronica gets herself into. Um, One of them is this teacher who is recently going through a divorce and Veronica manages to sort of um, uh, put it into her head that there is going to be this like beefcake thing happening so that the woman who had rejected her offer to babysit previously uh, finally does decide that she's going to take the night off and go do this, asks Veronica to babysit and then leaves her kid and her kid is a fucking tyrant and Veronica has to do everything that she was expressly forbidden to do in order to keep him from screaming at the top of his lungs. Um, I have to say that I'm like really not a huge fan of the like bitter woman divorcee stereotype as somebody who is a female divorcee who got a lot of like comments on my old podcast about how obviously I've become a feminazi because I'm bitter, that sort of thing irritates me now. And it's just like, you guys just don't even know what you're talking about. Oh my God. Maybe there's just some human growth happening. What do you think? Um, but it turns out that that's pretty much nothing like what's going on with that kid. Veronica goes to another home where the child is being like really put through his paces. He's got this strict schedule that he's like allowed half an hour of time for coloring and one hour of time for making and baking cookies. And he acts like this is such a drag. And I'm like, you're getting to make cookies. What are you talking about? What's wrong with you? And at the end of this, this kid is an angel. It seems Veronica is leaving and the kid's dad stops her on her way out. And he's got, first of all, he tells her that uh, we're going to call you again for sure. And we have a standing dinner date with friends on Friday. Saturdays, of course, I'm on the boat by myself. If you ever want to come around, smoke a J and fool around. We usually do a day trip about once a month with my boss, if you don't mind working on a Sunday. And she is absolutely flabbergasted. And I really liked this because people ask when women are like harassed or propositioned or whatever, why we don't yell at the person. But it's because of it. Of That scene is one of the realest depictions of it I've ever seen, where a man does it in such an offhand, casual way that for a moment, you're not even sure you heard them right. And they continue talking with no shame whatsoever so that you start to be like, I have that wrong. He didn't mean it that way. And it's not until it's over and you're able to focus because they keep talking and you walk away and think it over that you go, 
he 100% meant it that way. What the fuck? And it's too late. The moment's over and you going back and getting in their face at this point might be satisfying, but also might not do anything. And so you just decide, I guess I'm just going to ignore it and let it go. And men depend on the fact that we doubt ourselves in moments like that. So you can see Veronica's face that like, she's really disgusted and offended. But there's also this look of disbelief there. Like she's like, I have to have that wrong, right? Like, I didn't really hear you just say that to me. And um, he hands her this fucking drawing. And he's like, Edwin drew this for you. And it's obviously a picture of Veronica. And she is having her head come off her body. She's wearing, you know, the exact shirt that she's wearing, like the whole thing, but her head's coming off. And it's just a a real moment of like, what the fuck is going on in this fucking family, man? It's so weird. Um, So we'll go to the actual scene here that ends this episode. She and Duncan are breaking into Meg's house in order to find the sample journal that Meg says she has of this kid's handwriting. And as soon as this is opened, I'm looking at it and I'm like, this is not little boy handwriting. Like that's, that's, I think I said a woman's handwriting, even though it's obviously not a woman, but I was like, that's definitely girl's handwriting. And, um, Veronica finally like puts it together after looking at it for a little while. And Duncan, I think is the one who says, what if she was trying to cover? And, Veronica looks around the room and realizes that there's this like, you know, framed picture there. Sisters are forever. Um, And oh, no, it's she. What if she was covering? And Duncan looks at her and back at the picture and it seems to like sort of come together for him. Like he realizes what she's saying. And they go into the little sister's room. Now, I asked immediately, why are they going into her room? When she's going to be asleep in there and she's going to scream bloody murder that there are strangers in her room. They don't know that she's like, you know, locked in this little closet. They don't they don't know how this is going to go down, but they decide to take the risk anyway. It winds up paying off. It's fine. I'll let it go. It does seem like a weird move to me on the surface, but whatever. It's fine. And um, Veronica discovers these piles and piles of notebooks on the ground in front of this little doorway that have the same thing written in them over and over again. I mean, there's probably a, like about a hundred of them. Um, so they find the little doorway because the sister is making some noise in there. And she is sitting on a chair in this like nightgown as if she's, you know, on a farm in 1820. It's just this really creepy looking like, And they want her to come out and like a child would be who has been punished a lot before. She is unwilling to come out. She says, you know, you've got to go. They can tell when the door was open. I'm going to get in trouble. And Duncan tries to like talk her down. Veronica is about to call the cops when their father walks in. Megan and Grace's father. And this dude presents it. This guy. Before the cops even get there, he says, shut your evil mouth. Nobody believes a word you say, you filthy lying whore. Like the language that he's using is really intense. And. Oh, no, Lamb is here when he's saying all this. Okay. So Lamb comes up and he's cuffing her and Duncan. But there was something in his face when she's saying to him, there's a door in the closet that they were putting her in. And I was like, I think he believes her. You can see something in his face. And I didn't know if he was just going to brush it off because he personally doesn't like Veronica or what. But I decided to just sort of sit and wait and see what was going to happen. And he escorts them out. And then he comes back in and opens up the closet 
and goes through everything. And the father is like, you have no right to do any of this. What are you going through my stuff? I reported them. I want them prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Um, Lamb just completely ignores him and goes in there anyway. And it's very satisfying for him to be spouting off the way that he is and have Lamb just essentially completely bypass him. Um, you have no right to come into my house. I'm the victim here. Um, and Lamb walks up to him and says, it's funny. I heard my father give that exact speech once and then walks out. So Lamb had an abusive father who painted himself as the victim. And I just want to go on record here, guys. That's one of the most insidious things ever is somebody who did something wrong, painting themselves as the victim. I've recently had a big like personal blow up and the person who did something very, very wrong and very obviously wrong deleted a bunch of things to cover their tracks and then painted themselves as the one who was being unfairly persecuted. And a, like most people believed them. Most people did. And it was a really sad like moment in my life of me realizing that like as much as a lot of people claim to like and trust me, they do not like and trust me as much as I thought because they did not believe my version of things. And it's not a personal thing that I like when it's fine. It like in the end, it doesn't really matter, but it was one of those, like how easy it is to turn things around and make it seem like you're the one who's being wronged is kind of scary to me. And I found it really upsetting. And this scene of him being like, I'm the victim here. I was just like, ah, oh, fuck you, dude. Um, so yeah, this whole thing was just really like, so satisfying to watch. And Lamb goes out there and he drives the car like a block and then just lets them out. And he turns around and he goes back to Meg's house and just sits in the driveway to like let it be known that he is aware there is some shit going on and they better be fucking careful. So that was a very satisfying ending. And it's nice for Lamb to not be 100% human garbage all the time. I'm here for this. I'm here for the layers, baby. So, uh, yeah, this was good. Weird, though, but good. Um, so with that, guys, I'm over my time. But uh, thank you to Anya's for coming. She was the only one in the chat today. I think it being a little earlier in the day made it harder for some people to attend. Um, but thank you also to Jackie for commissioning this episode. Really appreciate that as well. And I hope you guys are enjoying the coverage. And I will be seeing you all again pretty soon, I think, with the next episode. So until then... Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.